Good afternoon and welcome to the Kitsap League of Women Voters Meet and Greet. And my name is Martha Burke. I'm your host and moderator for this event. So we've invited our uh, legislators to who represent us here in Kitsap County to come and and talk about the upcoming legislative session that starts January 11th, I believe, and to discuss how the state should plan and budget during this time of the coronavirus. So five of our legislators have accepted our invitation. Christine Rolfes, who's here, and she is the senator from the 23rd Legislative District, and she is chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the, in the Senate and responsible for the budget. Emily Randall is the senator from the 26th legislative district. Just wave, Emily, wherever you are. <laughs> I can't quite see the whole thing, but um, she is the senator from the 26th and she is majority whip. Jesse Young, I didn't see him, he's here. And he is the representative from the 26th legislative district. And he serves on the economic development committee among others. Um, Tara Simmons, she is our newly elected representative from the 23rd Legislative District. And um, she was just telling us what her um, committees are. And um, one of them I know is health and another one is, um, is safety, I believe. Uh, and then finally, representative from the 20, 35th Legislative District and the House is House, represent, House Republican Whip and that's Dan Griffey. Now, I don't know if Dan is here yet. He is, I was telling people uh, earlier, he is a firefighter and this is, uh, he's on call today. So he may not be able to, he said he's gonna try and at least pop in for part of the meeting. Uh, when he does show, we'll give him some time, uh, but um, we may not see him right away. So each of, our, rep, our legislators will be given a minute to highlight what they see as the most important priorities and challenges that they face going forward. And then we're going to open the meeting up for questions from you, the audience. So to start, everyone but our guests will be muted. And if you wish to ask a question, please use the chat function and you can send, your, send us your questions. And Colette, Colette Crosby is also working right there, working as the uh, uh co-host and so she can um she'll be reviewing the chat and um then sort of grouping the questions and then we'll give them to one or more of our guests to answer but um if you're unfamiliar with chat you can just raise your hand and we'll watch for that but i encourage you and i encourage you to ask questions but please understand that we have limited time and we may not be able to get to everybody's questions so let's get started and we'll begin kind of in um, seniority here. So Senator Rolfus, and then we'll go to Senator Randall, the two senators. So uh, Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm Christine Rolfus. I'm the state senator for the 23rd. And I know the League of Women Voters knows what the 23rd Legislative District is, but it's central and North Kitsap County and Bainbridge Island. And it's the part of Bremerton that is Minette and then East Bremerton over to Silverdale. As Martha said, I was, I've been the chair of the Ways and Means Committee for the last three sessions, and I was just selected by my colleagues to continue that job for this upcoming session. And so I also serve on the Agricultural Natural Resources Water and State Parks Committee, which is the fun one that deals with Puget Sound and forest fires and stuff like that. The, um, what I see as the big issues coming forward, and I'll just talk about the budget, I guess, specifically, is getting the pandemic under control. And I think with the introduction of vaccines and a vaccine plan for the state, we may be seeing um, the light at the end of the tunnel on this. Um, but public health is the big issue. Getting kids back into school safely is second issue. And then making sure parents have childcare for the kids that are younger than K-12 so that they can get back to work and start looking for jobs. And so just the stability of our economy is so dependent on those three things um, that those will be front and center of um, the, the budget development process. We will 
normally we don't do a budget and get it approved until the end of April, but we're working right now on an early action plan in case Congress doesn't come through for us so that we can have a stimulus program this winter that will help the schools with the funding that they're gonna to need to reopen um, and the other priorities that I mentioned, as well as a rescue package if we need to for small businesses and their workers. So those are, that's where I see kind of the priorities right now. Well, thank you, Christine. Um, and now Emily Randall. Um, so I'm, I know you're here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to see everyone's face when there's yes. so many wonderful folks joining well, us um, tonight. Yeah. I'm Senator Emily Randall. I represent the 26th Legislative District, which is the rest of Kitsap County that's not in the 23rd, as well as Gate Harbor and the Key Peninsula. I live in Bremerton and have served in the legislature for two sessions. This will be my third that I'm going into, and I'm so honored, you know, as Martha mentioned, to be able to step into um, this new leadership role as whip. I have a new puppy too, who is very excited to participate in this meeting. Um, <laughs> I, um, in addition to, um, in addition to the priorities that you know Senator Rolf and Rolf has laid out, which are you know important to our caucus, I focus. Um, you know, quite a bit on health equity and um, higher education access. As chair of the Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee and previously as vice chair for health and long-term care, um, I think what we've seen during the pandemic is yes, a need for immediate uh, public health response, as well as a huge light shown on the inequities that existed in our system prior to the onslaught of COVID-19. We um, you know, had folks who still didn't have access to affordable health care. And that's why in my first year, I sponsored the Pathway to Universal Health Care um, bill to establish a work group to really get to work on how we get the half a million folks at that time who weren't covered covered. Now those numbers have risen given um, the impact of the pandemic and job loss and folks who are newly finding themselves without um, meaningful health care coverage and coverage they can afford. Um, I also, um, you know, specifically have focused quite a bit over the last year and will continue to focus this year on uh, maternal health care. We have a lot of um, postpartum parents who depend on Apple Health and who only are covered for 60 days after giving birth. Um, we would like to extend that Medicaid coverage to a year so that new parents can, in addition to going to their regular um, follow-up visits for their kids, can get the health care that they need. There are so many stories of new moms who missed getting the care that they needed and had you know, terrible health outcomes, particularly in black and brown communities, um, because they didn't weren't able to get seen because they couldn't afford it or they weren't even thinking about you know, their own needs. They were just thinking about their kids. So that's, that's an area that I'll keep focusing on. And I work a lot also in the developmental disability space, supporting families um, and ensuring that we protect the funding that covers those supports for individuals experiencing disabilities and their caregivers as well. So that's, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Um, so Representative Young, uh, Jesse Young, and <laughs> so um, you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Martha. And thank you, League of Women Voters, for I, I appreciate the, the meet and greet and the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, the, you know, so I, I serve in the 26th District. Um, I serve on the Finance Committees and the Transportation Committee in Leadership, and then I serve on um, commerce and gaming and, and college and workforce development. Uh, so I, I have a pretty heavy schedule, but I like to dive into policy and um, kind of fits along with my background in pi private industry as a software engineer. Um, so in the context of uh, those committees, obviously transportation is pretty self-explanatory, but I help, I help write the budget there. Uh, the finance committee deals with, uh, in the house, whereas uh, Senator Rolfus deals with ways and means and kind of covers both sides of the budget. On, on, the, uh, on the House side, we 
split the budget up and do appropriations and finance. So finance deals with tax policy in the state. Um, so I, I work a lot on, on those aspects and, and do a lot of budget work in the House side. Um, with regard to my priorities going forward, yeah, it's a pretty straightforward three three uh, three part plan, and that is uh, getting the economy, especially helping people get back to work. I'm, we've had so many people reach out to our offices, especially workers that are on unemployment that can't get their unemployment checks. I mean, this week I've had over a dozen people that still haven't been paid unemployment uh, by the state since uh, April, and it just it just tugs on your heart when you see families struggling trying to provide not only to put food on the table for the family, but also afford their medicine and uh, hopefully stay in their house. Uh, so working on that, and then that dovetails right into health. Um, we have to be able to provide more money for our healthcare system. I think we need to be able to provide for our healthcare workers that are um, certainly getting exhausted now, but also provide for greater bed counts so that we don't have to worry about shutting the economy down so much if we start seeing uh, cases rise. Um, that way we can kind of Imagine if we could take all of our money and put it towards healthcare and not have to worry about the, the business side of things. So those are two key things. And then also making sure our kids get back in school. Uh, th there's a, another metric that's being uh, measured around the country now that's growing and it's called the uh, deaths of despair. Uh, and they're, they're lumping forward uh, not only suicides, but um, other healthcare uh, related, especially mental health disorders and other things that are starting, we're starting to see those numbers rise uh, because people are dealing with so many other stresses in their life as we try to solve the COVID problem. So those are those would be my top three uh, categories. And with regard to students, we're seeing that rise with students that are dealing with mental health issues now because they're stuck at home and uh, we need to get schools back open. So I'd be focusing on those three. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to go to um, Tara Simmons, unless, uh, unless I missed uh, and uh, Dan has shown up. So Tara, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. I am um, <clears throat> glad I got to go after the experts here who've been in office a lot longer. Um, I'm coming into the legislature as a freshman in a really difficult time where it's hard to actually learn my job. And it's so much is, um, interacting with you know staff and, and research policy staff and OPR and caucus. And so yes, I'm grateful that Senator Wolf has sent me an invite on, on Saturday because my plan is to do whatever Senator Wolf has tells me I need to do um, for the interim. <laughs> no, um, really our, our um, priorities, you know, in my um, uh, caucus in, in the house is focused around four things, which is uh, response to COVID-19, um, economic recovery, uh, racial in injustice and inequities, and, and climate change. And we've actually received some guidance from our, our um, leadership that uh, during this virtual session that we're going to have, uh, you know, all of our bills really need to be prioritized under those four things for this year. Um, so I was really happy to be appointed to the healthcare committee because I wasn't was an active nurse for 11 years. I'm still a registered nurse, um, but really want to get involved with the good work that Senator Randall has been leading around um, universal healthcare pathways. And um, so I'm excited to join that. I think in the immediate, we do need to get the vaccination distributed in a very equitable way, um, specifically targeting our most vulnerable populations, places where people congregate and live um, together, such as inside our prisons. Right now we are having rampant um, COVID outbreaks in our prisons, also in long-term care facilities, um, homeless shelters and those types of um, places. We also need to make sure that people have adequate testing and PPE. Um, all of those things are probably a top priority. Um, it, with the economic recovery, you know, making sure that we don't cut um, from our most vulnerable communities, any services that people are reliant upon. We know that if we cut um, you know, basic needs that we will be worse off in, in the long run. So how do we do that when our tax is so dependent upon sales tax and revenues are down? Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to really rethink our tax system in Washington state and how we can have the wealthiest among us paying their fair share and that we um, do not cut from vulnerable middle class and low income people during these times. Uh, along with that is childcare. I, I hear over and over again the burden of childcare costs on our working families, and we do need to make investments in early learning and childcare. Um, so I'm excited to support those efforts. 
I was really happy today to learn I'm on uh, the vice chair of the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee um, because you know civil rights and racial inequities are important and we should be looking at all of our legislation um, through that lens, especially in light of 2020 and all that has happened um, with the death of George Floyd and the aftermath of that. And let's not forget and continue to push that work forward. And so I am also happy that I'm on the Public Safety Committee where we will be taking up the matter of law enforcement reform and, and building coalitions and um, support around that. So those are the priorities that I see right now. I will also say my freshman bill is something I think the League of Women Voters are, will be happy about, and that is voter reenfranchisement for formerly incarcerated people. And I think the League of Women Voters has... Um... What? Uh-oh, what did I just do? Um, uh, uh, to take it on as my, my first bill. Thank you. Oh, you lost me for a minute. Yes, I will I say that um, access to internet is really important too. Uh, and I'm happy that, that our colleague Drew Hansen in the 23rd is uh, leading that effort because that is really important. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Tara. Um, so we're gonna open it to questions and I guess maybe as, as moderator, I'll, I'll take a crack at the first question, but then we'll, we'll open it up. But it did strike me as listening to all of you and you all talk very, um, very well about the needs. And yet I know we have a budget gap and which I believe right now is about $2 billion. So how, <coughs> how are we going to meet all of these critical needs that you've talked about um, within, you know, and and meet that gap. Are we going to need new revenue or re how are we going to do it? So, um, Christy, maybe you'd like to start by talking about this and then, but I'll, uh, if other, if other ones, if other people have a something they'd like to add to it, please do. So go ahead. Well, let's just I'm, let's just start by acknowledging that we had the needs before the pandemic. So the and the economy is worse than it was before, and state revenues are worse than they were before, and our needs are even greater. So let's just start with that preface. Um, this I do we we do have an unusual situation where because of the governor's vetoes and agencies walking back spending and people not using government services, like less people going to college, schools having lower enrollment, et cetera. We have almost $2 billion in unspent, unspent um, appropriations that we made just last year. So oddly, the budget is actually balanced. If the legislature never came back, it would all be legal and constitutional. It's budgeted, it's balanced for almost four years. Um, so, but that's based on a situation where people didn't have access to services because of the pandemic. And so it's not a sustainable situation and it's not, it's not a budget that we want to be um, <laughs> building a future based upon. Um, we also, however, have about $2 billion in the rainy day fund. And so I'm confident, and I heard the uh, House Republican leadership say today, that we're in a rainy day and that's the time to use the rainy day fund. So I'm confident that we can rebuild part of our economy earlier in session by um, a bipartisan agreement with the governor on how to invest in the economy early using rainy day, some of the rainy day funds. And then this is certainly gonna be a conversation. I'm not gonna pretend the Republicans are gonna help, um, but we're gonna be talking about progressive tax reform and whether this is the year that we will um, have the votes and whether it will be good, good, it won't harm the economy to ask people who have been doing okay and have even made more money on this economy to help the people that have lost their jobs and are, start, are, and are needing to rebuild. So we're gonna be looking in the Senate at um, tax policies and we'll be having hearings on those in January. Is, does anybody want to add to that, uh, uh, like Representative Young or, or uh, do you, would you like to say anything more about uh, regarding that since? Uh... Well, 
I, I think to uh, in, in acknowledge in part that uh, first off, Senator Rolfes is extremely ex respected in terms of uh, her efforts and, and work in what is a, a really controversial committee because Republicans and Democrats disagree a lot on, on policies like tax policy. And uh, to get a four-year balanced budget uh, that we did pass, even with some of the hurdles that she just described, is a is a is a really a strong accomplishment. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge that first, because yeah, if, if we were to talk about some of our differences, if I didn't acknowledge that first, you might think that we only disagree on things. And um, the truth is, I I agree uh, with uh, what Re Senator Rolfe has brought up about yeah, House Republicans uh, at least. I, I can't speak for the Senate. Um, we do agree that this is the time when you would use rainy day funds. And uh, this is the type of a scenario where you would use them. How we might use them, we might differ a little bit, but I think we generally agree, at least in, in my mind, the first place that we'd want to use those rainy day funds is to make sure that anybody that has not been able to get an unemployment check and has had to struggle making it through the economy, we should release them for that to make sure people can afford to pay rent. I mean, the thought of a, a single parent mom um, trying to put food on the table for her kid because she hasn't been able to work her job, uh, that, that's scary. And so we want to take care of that. That's what rainy day funds are for. Um, with regard to how we actually uh, balance the budget going forward, I would tend to take a different look on the economy uh, than that. I don't know that anybody is doing well other than the major mega corporations that the governor is allowed to stay open. So I'm not inclined to want to help them, but struggling small businesses and the employees of those, I don't want to raise taxes on anything that would touch that area of the economy. Any, any type of business entrepreneur that may have been profitable prior to uh, COVID because the economy was going good. I think we need to just acknowledge up front that those people are struggling too. And I don't want to see any tax policy, even if we want to call it progressive, that would come down and, and um, negatively affect us. Because as soon as we can get beyond COVID, we want to see the economy open up. And if we do see the economy open up, then the potential conflicts that we might have in debating on uh, you know, right types of tax policy get easier to solve because if the economy starts to rebound quicker than the tax revenue that we receive under the current tax structure grows. And if the tax revenue grows, then it makes the problem of figuring out who to give that money to, where to spend it, where it's most needed, gets easier to solve. And so from a, a standpoint of solving that crisis going forward, as we try to project a budget four years out, um, I'd rather see uh, tax policy that, uh, that really prioritizes getting the economy back going because when the economy is going, our revenues really soar through the roof and uh, then, we, then we can afford to fund those areas where it's most needed. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, anybody, um, anybody else or we'll go on to a different question. So Colette, have you been uh, taking a look at the chat? Yes, I have. And um, I, there's a good follow up question because um, some of our speakers have been talking about the rainy day fund and it, there was a question about how it actually gets um, accumulated and and what if any uh, constraints there are on its use. So um, do you guys want me to take that? All right. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at Emily. Okay, so the rainy day fund was set up before the recession. It was approved by the voters. I don't know. I can't, I don't know with certainty if it's in the constitution, but it's, um, I think that it may have been a constitutional amendment. Regardless, we have one. A lot of states have one. It's established a certain percentage of revenue that comes into the state coffers automatically bounces into a rainy day fund. I can't remember what the percentage is, but it's like 1% and it automatically goes in. For us, it's about um, 300 to $500 million a year automatically goes into the rainy day fund. When that total hits, um, when the balance of the rainy day fund hits a certain point, and that point is 10% of what the average revenue is annually, when it hits that point, that money can be moved out of the rainy day fund with a simple majority of the vote for school construction costs. Otherwise it keeps growing. However, if there is a rainy day, that money can be moved out before it hits that point. And we were actually ironically almost hitting the point where our rainy day fund was at its maximum um, maximum account level 
the money was going to stop bouncing in and we were going to be able to start appropriating it had we wanted to. We were almost there. But now because unemployment because of unemployment, there's a certain un there's a certain employment trigger and an economic growth trigger. And we've hit those triggers because of the pandemic. That means that money can be spent with a simple majority vote, however the legislature deems it wants to. Prior to this year, we had, um, we were able to spend it because you can also spend it if it's not a catastrophe with a um, super majority of the legislature. And we had um, kind of habitually used it to pay back the Department of Natural Resources for forest fires, for unanticipated forest fire costs. Um, but that's what the rainy day fund is and how it's set up. And it's at a balance of about $2 billion. And if we don't spend it, it'll be about 3 billion by the end of four years. So even if we spend it, it will get automatically replenished. So it's, it's actually not like your savings account at home, <laughs> which doesn't automatically get replenished. The state's rainy day fund automatically keeps getting replenished. Um, I think, Tara, did you have your hand up? Was that, uh, did I see that? No. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Anyway, so Colette, uh, uh, next, the next question? Yeah, I think um, the next follow, natural question to follow is um, circling back to Senator Rolf's comment about trying to work on progressive tax reform. Um, I think there's some interest in knowing what types of tax are even on the, you know, on the table, so to speak. Um, a couple of people have asked about uh, personal income tax, as uh, which they some people have said probably is a little bit less regressive than uh, increasing sales tax. Um, also, there was a related question about. Um, so that's it. That's that's the main question around progressive tax reform and what's likely to be considered, and possibly well, pass into law. Tara, would you like to speak on that? Well, I am not an expert like Senator Rolfes, who really is the expert, but I can just tell you, you know, I'm a board member for the Economic Opportunity Institute that is a think tank that, um, you know, supports the legislature with research. And I've been in some conversations lately. Um, it's looking like capital gains is the uh, most likely um, to possibly pass the legislature this, this coming session. I will say that there's several bills being introduced on the House side, um, you know, really aimed at um, collecting revenue from the wealthiest people in our state, such as excessive compensation tax, where it's like a payroll tax um, on big corporations that pay uh, salaries of over a million dollars a year. Um, I have also seen, you know, some um, um, legislators would be willing to introduce something around like a millionaire income tax. Whether these things are likely to pass the legislature, I can't tell you because I'm pretty new. Um, but in these proposals, uh, I do see that they are trying to also give some relief to small businesses. Um, so by reducing the B&O tax on our small businesses. So it's really about trying to address um, the regressive nature of how we collect taxes through sales tax and property tax and and come up with ideas like capital gains, wealth um, tax is one that I know is being introduced um, and excessive compensation and potentially uh, income tax where the people who have the largest incomes would pay uh, a percentage of their earnings. Uh, and maybe we can start to relieve some of the sales tax and B&O tax and those types of things. But Senator Rolfes probably has a way better answer than me. Um. Well, I wonder, actually, I'd like to hear from Representative Young, because it seems like this is consistent or not inconsistent with some of the things that you were talking about earlier. Uh, if we could do something that would benefit small businesses, reduce the B&O tax, and maybe uh, you'd mention these, you know, you're not a, necessarily a friend of the really large corporations. Um, if that was targeted more towards them. Is that something you think that Republicans could, or at least some Republicans could uh, support? If we're talking specifically about a capital gains tax, I, I, I honestly don't think you're gonna find much support um, in, the, in the Republican caucus from anybody. I think that's what 
Senator Rolfes was alluding to earlier, if, if that's the proposal that they uh, that they come up with. And uh, generally speaking, um, uh, the the plan with regard to the BNO tax, I think you find a lot across the bo board uh, bipartisan support because we know that our BNO tax is flawed because it, it generally taxes businesses on their gross receipts as opposed to their net. And mm -hmm. that can be a problem for a business that actually netted out no profit, still having to pay taxes. That doesn't really seem uh, intuitive. It's, it's rather counterintuitive. And it's, not, it's also a competitive disadvantage for the state. Uh, the, the plan that I've put forward uh, has been, you know, was written about in the Seattle Times. Uh, it was called the Boise Plan. That was an acronym that stood for a, a dual uh, statewide moratorium on B&O taxes and an impact statements on everything, B-O-I-S-E. And the, the goal there would be to um, acknowledge that our businesses are going to need a kind of a jump start to get back open. Uh, some of them have closed for good, but we know that there are other businesses that might step up. And the ones that have been able to uh, weather the storm, so to speak, uh, they need a little kickstart. And so if we were to give them a moratorium for a certain period of time on their B&O taxes um, to get them opened back up as COVID starts to wane or as we come up with a solution for it, what you would see is uh, an, uh, a leveraging effect on our budget. See, at the end of the day, whereas mostly what you see in a campaign cycle is uh, kind of 30 second ads where legislators are really, I see that my video's cut now and I think you can still hear me. I'll just leave that off for a second. The, uh, in 30 second ads, we're constrained in how we talk to you because we only have so much money to put TV ads on. But if you really get down into economic policy, I think mostly what we wanna see is we wanna see greater revenue so that we have the money to afford to afford the things that the state of Washington needs to provide for health, to provide for wellness, to provide for school, to provide for our communities for safety. Um, and in that regard, I believe that the model that works better is to get the economy going so that it produces more revenue. And I think that that model lends towards uh, a tax reduction. Now, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle tend to disagree with that, and that's okay. But in this case, most of our revenue comes through sales tax. So if we took a short pause on what accounts for about 15 to 18% of our revenues, which is a B&O tax, which allowed businesses to re-enter the market. And as commerce started to grow, our sales tax revenues would jump. I would prefer to try a measure like that instead of pursuing a capital gains tax or some new taxing model, because I'm fearful that if we implement that new model, that will scare the restart of businesses that we need. If we make it higher or harder for businesses to restart because we're putting or potentially frightening new businesses that could come in from out of state, especially what I want to see is more technology businesses move up from California, which will create more jobs that are high paying jobs that support families. Um, if we scare them away by telling them that we're going to tax you more with a capital gains tax, then we're actually hurting the economic growth that will produce more revenue. It's it's a matter of math um, that you know gets you know beyond a 30 second talking point and a lot of people don't have the attention span or, or because they're living their life for it. But I would prefer that model first rather than uh, a new type of type of taxing scheme. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Colette, you want to give us the next questionnaire? Sorry. Is it okay if we just keep going on a few more tax questions? Sure. Okay. Um, so I think the question was, and, and um, Jesse Young might have addressed it. Uh, I think there were, the question came in more or less concurrent with some of his remarks, but if the B&O tax is lowered, what could be used to offset that decline in tax revenue? There's a completely other question around taxes, which is if someone could explain what a wealth tax really is, like how would it work? That'd be great. Who would? Would well, you I'm just going to jump in and answer a piece of that, if okay. that, that's okay, yeah. Martha. Um, yeah. You know, call it you, the part of the question was, if we lower um, B&O taxes and that, and um, and then to uh, Representative Young's point, see a spike in sales tax, that might offset some of that. What I worry about, and I'm not in all the, you know, tax and revenue discussions, I spend most of my time on health and higher ed policy, and I also sit on transportation, but um, we know that Washington's tax system, as um, Tara mentioned, is one of the most regressive in the country, and we know that sales tax, you know, hits our lowest income families at such a higher percentage of their income 
than um, the percentage of the income that high earning families pay in sales tax. And so I really worry about um, that redirection of um, you know, dependence on tax revenue on a much more regressive form of taxes. I also have some concerns as higher ed chair um, of lowering BNO taxes, which um, are, are B, we have a BNO tax surcharge right now on our, um, our highest earning technology companies um, to help us pay for higher education for lowest income Washingtonians in order to fill some of those technology jobs. Right now, what I hear from Amazon and Microsoft and the big tech companies is they cannot recruit enough people from Washington to fill the jobs that are available because Washington students don't have the training they need. We're not training enough Washingtonians to fill those jobs. So Microsoft and Amazon and other big tech companies are recruiting from out of state when we could be training more Washington students um, to fill those jobs here in Washington. And um, I'm all about recruiting more exciting industry to our state. I think we have a lot of potential, but I don't know that by limiting our higher education budget, by lowering um, you know, the, uh, the expected revenue from those big tech giants that are grossing so much during um, this time of online shopping, um, that, that that's the solution. I'd like to see a, a little more nuanced approach and I'm sure that Senator Rolfes has some other thoughts on, um, on that question. Well, I don't know if you wanna jump in, Christine, but I do have a, a to follow up on that a little bit. I wonder if it's a question of the B&O tax, if it can be just restructured. I mean, because Senator Randall, you were saying um, something, you know, if you're, in other words, if you are, charging a B&O tax just on the high profitable companies, not on every business, whether they're making money or not, uh, if that wouldn't help to direct it uh, and be more nuanced, as you were saying. So. Sure. And the work of the tax structure work group has been spending um, you know, months together looking at just this, how to rethink the BNO tax system, our sales tax system, um, because you're right, like uh, small businesses are also burdened the same way that low income families are burdened by our tax structure. We need to do better by them. Christine, do you want to say? Yeah, I, I did want to jump in on a couple things. First off, I want to say I'm not exactly sure what the wealth tax is. Um, I, there's been a bunch of proposals and I'll let if Tara knows, because I think her the think tank she's on the board of has been working on that. Um, but to skip to the B&O tax, the B&O tax, if you don't own a business in the state, you have, you don't really, uh, you don't really know what the burden is of the B&O tax. And it is clearly one of the most unfair taxes in the state, if not in the country, but it's ours, it's our tax. And um, that's what we have. What is more fair, B&O tax is a tax on gross sales, not on profits. And so people argue that we should have a profits tax which is, by the way, an income tax. So instead of having a B&O about business and occupation tax, the alternative is to have a corporate income tax, which is what most states have. However, to transition from a B&O tax to a corporate income tax is to overhaul the entire corporate tax structure in the state, which is not a job you do um, easily. It's politically not easy and it's economically very difficult and you create a whole nother group of winners and losers. So um, there's not an easy way out of this B&O tax problem. A nuanced approach that I'd like to look at, I think first of all, to argue that we should lower the B&O taxes for businesses that have been um, not working for eight months is actually quite affordable because they're not generating <laughs> They're, they're not generating taxes because they're out of business right now. So what you want to do really is look at your tax policy, not as a campaign like let's get rid of B&O taxes, but as an economic, um, uh, economic tool. And I think it's very, very rational to say for those businesses that have been shut down, either because of the governor or because of the pandemic, one or the other, and there's an overlap, but they're not all the same. 
those businesses that have been main, they have ongoing costs and a lot of them have continued to keep employees on even without work, they shouldn't be punished by having to pay um, BNO taxes. And if there's a way that we can work in a tax, a tax forgiveness um, into this over the next six months, I'm very open to that. And even looking at whether we can use our rainy day funds to help the restaurants, the bowling alleys, the theaters, just the companies that have really um, been walloped unfairly um, by, by, the, um, by the pandemic. So there's a lot of creativity and I think there's a lot of shared interest um, among parties and um, with business community as well to see if there's a way forward here. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Colette, do you have uh, another, any other questions for us? This is more on the, the budget slash spending side. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pair these two questions just because they sort of fall into the same bucket. One is um, apparently in Seattle, uh, community college has now been made or is they're working to make co community college free for public high school grads in the city. Um, question is any outlook for that for the rest of Washington state? And then a related funding question is um, what's the likelihood of a higher investment for broadband uh, for the state and for residents? Well, the one Senator that sounds, Senator Randall, that sounds like the, on the education, maybe that's one for you. Sure, I'm happy to take that. So, um, you know, a college promise free community college is something that a lot of places have been exploring. Um, I was actually, you know, looking at drafting a bill um, in my first year in the legislature about that. And then I learned about um, the Workforce Education Investment Act that uh, our neighbor Drew Hansen had been working on, which is a huge expansion of what was the state need grant to become the Washington College grant and it's income based. So um, low income families and students, no matter how old you are, you're coming out of high school or not, if you don't have a bachelor's degree and you meet the income qualifications, then you can get free college at Olympic College or University of Washington. Um, and that's for the the easiest numbers for me to remember, a family of four making around $54,000 qualifies for that free education. And it's really exciting. It's opened doors to so many more students because in the days before we passed it, um, you know, we had the state need grant where you could qualify, but there was a wait list. And it, if it wasn't funded, then you didn't get that financial aid and you had to either defer school or figure out a path forward. Um, and now the, the Washington College Grant is an entitlement, which means that any student who qualifies can get the education that they need to get one of those good jobs in Washington, a technology job, a job as a nurse, high needs fields where we um, desperately need students to train. So um, I think we, may con we also saw a big investment in that bill in our community and technical colleges to help them increase slots and um, help students who are first gen navigate the college system. Um, really proud of my brother who as a 32 year old um, after you know dropping out of his first quarter at Central at 18 is now finishing his first quarter at um, OC on a pathway to a nursing degree. And there are so many you know folks of all ages just like Zach who are either going to school for the first time or retooling their career later. And that's possible because of this investment we made that's funded through um, great investments from big tech corporations, big business who gross over a million dollars a year. Um, Tara, uh, if you're st still here, did you wanna add anything? You're gonna be on some of these committees, is that right? On the internet access, issue well is that one of the ones you're going to be working on no no that is uh i don't even know which committee that will go through probably uh state government and tribal relations i believe um the education um on the education i'm not going to be on the education committees oh, okay. i'm a huge champion and i think we have our district pretty well covered because we have senator randall who is the chair over in the senate and then we have drew hansen who was the chair of 
college and workforce development um, and recently just became chair of civil rights and judiciary, but it's still on that committee. Um, so I will support their leadership on these issues and, um, you know, have a story of my own going to community college and my husband who's 43 um, just finished his first quarter back at Olympic college. Um, and I really love our, our local community colleges that give first, second, third and fourth chances to so many people, um, you know, at any stage of life. So I will be a big champion uh, and I will look to them to how I can be supportive. Well, thank you. Yeah. What? Yeah, now we're gonna shift to some policy questions. Um, this one is about um, the proposed merger of Virginia Mason and Catholic Health Care initiatives um, that would make over 52% of the hospital beds in Washington state in Catholic controlled hospitals. Um, CHI appears to prohibit many legal medical services because of their ethical and religious directives. Are you concerned about that? And if so, is there anything that can be done to protect secular health care options? I'm not sure who who's best to answer take that question. Anybody? I think Senator Randall is probably best um, to answer it uh, right now, and I am hoping to get there very quickly because I will be joining the healthcare committee, and I am worried about that too. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy to start, and would you know invite anyone to add anything? I know that Senator Walpus has been a supporter of this work too. Um, you know, as, as residents of the Kitsap Peninsula, we have depended on, um, you know, our single hospital access. Um, and uh, I know a lot of you were involved in some organizing around the um, Harrison proposed move to Silverdale. We, you know, uh, I grew, I was born at Harrison and saw my grandma, you know, worked there for, 30 years and um, know that this is an essential part of our community. But we, since since um, the merger with CHI, we have seen our acquisition, we've seen some challenges. And I worked um, over the last biennium on some policy with Nicole Macri to require at the very least notification of what service, reproductive health care services are available when you go to a hospital. Like if you are, um, having a miscarriage, you're not going to think, oh, I wonder which hospital I should go to because this one will give me the service that I want and this one won't. Like when you're in an emergent healthcare situation, you're not having the, you, you don't have the time, the luxury of time to think about um, whether you can drive or take the ferry to a hospital in Seattle in order to get the care that you need. Um, it's not just important for reproductive health care, it's also important for end of life care. In Washington, you know, the voters, overwhelmingly approved um, the right to um, death with dignity. And it is important that folks can get the care that they need and that they're entitled to no matter what hospital is in their backyard. And so I have been working with advocates in the ACLU, um, reproductive health folks, um, folks um, who support end of life care around ensuring that we have some parameters, some insights, some oversight into um, hospital mergers. Washington, I heard a funny statistic and as a, um, you know, someone who is christened in the Catholic church feel free, comfortable saying this, but Washington has one of the lowest concentrations of Catholics, practicing Catholics, but the highest concentration of Catholic hospitals. Um, and so what we're seeing is not only about religion, but it's about out of state big entities taking over pieces of our healthcare system in order to maximize profits. You know, over this pandemic, we saw, um, you know, the impacts of um, a big hospital business that wasn't listening to employees when they raised the alarm about lack of PPE. And when they worried about, you know, what would happen when we had an outbreak in our hospitals. And so I think it is important from a labor perspective, from a right to comprehensive healthcare perspective, from a protecting the little guy from big corporate behemoth perspective that we um, work with the attorney general and, and advocates to ensure that we have uh, protections around mergers and acquisitions. Um, did you want to add anything, Christine? 
I mean, really, Emily covered it. Okay. But I do want to say for um, folks that I work for, I'm very concerned about this. I um, feel really strongly that it's okay for a religious organization to run a hospital, but they, they, I don't think it's okay for that hospital to be run like a religious organization. And um, I've expressed that concern to the attorney general's office. I'm very concerned. We've seen the monopolistic tendencies of CHI in North, in North Kitsap. And I'm just concerned that um, we'll lose, Virginia Mason is a clinic on Bainbridge Island that a lot of people use. And once that becomes Catholic, we have even fewer non-Catholic healthcare choices. And again, if the, if the, Catholic healthcare choices were being run consistent with Washington state laws and not consistent with religious faith, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, having said that, even if CHI wasn't religious, I'd have a concern about one corporation taking over all of the state's hospitals. And um, that's not in our best interest either. Competition in healthcare. Um, Right now, people don't want a government organization to run healthcare, so I don't know why we would, we would allow one corporation to run healthcare. Yeah, that's a, a good comment. So, Colette, is there another next question? There is a related question on healthcare um, and related to this issue, which is um, if smaller hospital systems are sort of being picked up by CHI because they they've hit some kind of a financial wall. Is there, um, are there any alternatives available that the state might consider just in order to balance the finances a little bit better for them? I, that I, who can answer that? Would you, okay, well, Senator uh, Randall? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, we've done some good work around um, uh, establishing a work group to um, explore total cost of care. Um, we know that there are problems in the healthcare system, funding model problems, administrative model problems, but some of the problems um, include not having insight into the healthcare system um, financing piece. Um, and so there's work happening there. I think there, there's another bill um, being worked on uh, with labor and healthcare advocates around hospital system transparency, getting good insight into the financial model of the hospitals. You know, they often say they're doing this much charity care or this much um, community investments, but there's not really a, accountability measures there for us to know how um, those entities are are spending money. Are they, you know? I don't know. It, there were some ridiculous examples that I can't recall exactly for what folks were doing for community benefit. And, um, and I think we have more to do. There's also, you know, some other levelers that we can work on. Um, last year, we passed a, a pediatric Medicaid rate increase that the governor vetoed when we were worried about the, um, you know, the budget implications of COVID and the pandemic. And, and so I know that we'll, we'll be going back and exploring um, Medicaid rate increases, looking for other waiver options. That's new services that we can fund through Medicaid and get federal matching dollars. Um, you know, looking at providing more support towards um, small practice providers, ARNPs who, you know, are meeting the needs of patients. We need to support, um, you know, just like in the business community, thinking about those small business over owners, not the big hospital behemoths. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Jesse wants to, Jesse, are you trying to talk? Yeah, um, here, I guess I'll, cut my, I'll cut my video. Can you, can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you. Well, I, I think that there's a, a unique opportunity that we have right now because oftentimes seeing the big picture from the individual questions can be hard, but the way that the natural questioning here is kind of matriculated gives us an opportunity to juxtapose B and O taxes with these um, problems that was just asked in the last question that Colette shared with, well, what can we do to remedy this kind of matriculation to these single corporate providers? And um, so here, here's what happened. I mean, Senator Randall brought up the, the bill with regard to education when we talked about free college and Seattle and talked about the bill that Representative Hansen had brought forward. 
Well, you know, I serve on, I'm one of the seven members that serves on a tax structure work group for the entire state. And one of the things that we've brought up um, when Senator Hansen's bill, which I voted against, was we said, if you pass this bill, you're going to see the very problem that we're seeing right now happen in our communities. And what that bill did in order to fund free college education for kids was it raised taxes on these very hospitals that are incorporated that are now having to sell out to the bigger players that are bigger corporations because they can't afford to make ends meet because their tax bill went up. And this is where you start to see BNO tax policy affect our healthcare. These smaller entities, and, and I agree with Senator Rolfus, I don't want to see just one corporation anywhere. I, I don't trust big corporations, whether they're Catholic or not. I, I want to see opportunities and options for people to have uh, the, the ability to go to the doctor of their choice, to go to the healthcare provider of their choice. But when tax policy starts to wipe out the smaller players because you, you, you want to fund free college education for kids, and in order to do it, you got to increase the, the tax net to include smaller hospital corporations to pay that bill, what you have is the effect of taking away health care options from, from fixed income seniors and low income uh, single parent families. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. And it, it's taken a couple of years to matriculate, but that's why we voted, uh, a lot of Republicans voted against Senator or Representative Hansen's bill because we saw what would happen in a couple of years as a result of raising this, what was billed as a corporate tax, but really affected these small hospital operations that are now getting gobbled up by the bigger corporations because only the bigger corporations can afford the tax. And what I think we need to do to address that issue is to strategically carve out those B&O taxes on the smaller hospital corporations so that they can afford to open back up and provide local health care options to uh, the targeted communities, whether it's seniors or single parent families. Any of our targeted uh, at-risk demographics need to have more options, not less. And I don't want to see them sardined into just one corporate model, whether it's a Catholic uh, corporation or otherwise. And that's where you start to see the long-term effect of tax policy with healthcare policy kind of overlap. And Martha, I want to say, can I say a couple of things before mm -hmm. we move on? And maybe this will be a lead into different um, questions. Um, I do want to address Representative Young's issue. Um, we exempted hospitals in the end from that tax increase. What we, who we didn't exempt were um, the doctors that are if not affiliated with hospitals. And so they're very upset at the inequity of that. And we've been um, struggling with what to do about that um, ever since the tax was passed actually. Um, the other part about healthcare, it, um, oh, and I do I also want folks to know, we have sent millions of dollars to rural hospitals over the last couple of years for exactly this problem. They, they don't even, the private um, hospitals, the big corporations don't even want to buy them because they're not profitable. And so they're having a hard time balancing their budgets and they're not, they don't have, they don't have um, buyout opportunities either. So this is a, like this hospital situation is at the forefront and it's almost, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches in some cases, right? Some people um, have new hospitals being built in their counties and other people have hospitals um, that can't even make it. So we've been dealing with this from a budget and policy perspective for quite a few years. The other part of this is though that the whole healthcare system's messed up. So we just, my office just got a call from a woman on Bainbridge Island who had a prescription at Walgreens um, for a, a common um, allergy medicine that was $800 at the Walgreens on Bainbridge Island which it had never been before. So she called around and the Walgreens in Port Orchard was willing to sell it to her for $253. And she emailed my office and said, what's going on with this? Um, is Walgreens on Bainbridge allowed to do that? And it turns out they are, um, it's, it's a competitive market. Um, you know, and we, so the, every asset, every aspect of our healthcare system is messed up right now. Yeah. And it's not because of COVID. It was like this a year ago. So I don't know, Colette, does that lead into uh, maybe questions about uh, universal health care? <laughs> I haven't seen any questions about universal health care, but uh, sounds like like it's a question from you, Martha. So we could uh, you could just ask it. 
Well, I don't know. It seems that seems like a pretty complicated issue. I mean, if we can't solve the issues on tax policy in this meeting, I'm not sure we're going to address be able to cover uh, health care also. So I think we'll just go back to uh, what questions you're getting, Colette. Sure. Um, this is another sort of long one. I'll see if I can parse it. Um, it feels like this, this person's perspective is that the, uh, the sort of polarization of our political um, environment has carried over into some polarization and politicization of COVID response. And, um, and so the question to um, our legislators is, do you agree with the measures Governor Inslee has directed to control the spread of the, of the virus? If yes, what do you say to people who don't believe they should comply? If no, what do you say to people to justify your position against these measures? Hmm. Well, um, I don't want to pick on anybody on this one. Um, but I don't know, Representative Young, are you still there? Um, yeah, I'm, still here. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I thought yeah, you might have some. I, I imagine that in, in this environment, um, I'm probably uh, the one that's more likely to disagree with the governor's approach, uh, probably more broadly and in, in specifics. But what I would say is that uh, I don't agree with the governor's assessment of risk. And I think that that's a, a key component to understanding the way that he, um, he has addressed this. I, ideally, if I'd been governor, I would have, um, yeah, I would have issued a different plan and I'm happy to talk about that plan, but I don't want to start the plan and think that I'm, and have you think I'm not trying to answer the question. Specifically, um, the governor started us on a path that led down a, a phased approach, which was four phases. And in, in late October, he jumped off that path. He chose to do that. Um, a lot of us Republicans were asking for us to come back into special session specifically because we were prepared uh, as a caucus to uh, start reallocating more money out of the rainy day fund to provide for certain solutions. The solutions that I wanted was to address uh, the bed count issue because the governor's now bringing it up. But we knew back in April that when winter hit, regardless of all the specifics of, uh, uh, you know, what we're trying to figure out scientifically about COVID, we knew that it was going to start to spike when colder weather hit. And so we had that window of opportunity during the summer to try to address gaps in our healthcare system that would have provided for more beds for um, uh, healthcare fatigue among the people that are serving in our uh, healthcare fa uh, facilities. And those are the very problems the governor is citing right now that he's using to close us down again. And that's not following the science. We had the four phase plan. He jumped off of it. I don't think that we should have. I think we should have stuck to the regional four phase plan and we might not have seen the spikes that we saw now. And if we had allocated more money towards bed counts, what that would have done is created a greater margin for us to deal with any spikes, while at the same time, not exacerbating the economic problem that we're having. And if imagine what happens now, if we've got to choose between giving money towards the economic problem instead of the healthcare, we don't want to have to make that choice. We want to have enough money so that the economy is providing for itself. People are having money to put food on the table, provide for their, their medical, medical prescription drugs, while at the same time, we, at the state, we can go continue to fund healthcare response. That would be a better solution. And I, I wish that we had stayed on the governor's own plan for science. I'm not, keep in mind, I'm not beating him up on the science of that. I'm just stating to you that he came up with that plan and then he chose to jump off of it in late, uh, or in late September, early October. And when he did that, um, I think that that created the, the, the additional problem that we have right now on top of the fact that he didn't call us back in the session so that we could help him together in a bipartisan way solve the problem of bed counts and healthcare fatigue. And that's been the unfortunate miss. And as a result, I think you're seeing a lot of people uh, now come into a situation or a scenario where if they don't get back to work, it's existential to them. Can they afford their mortgage payment? Can they afford their rent? Or can they afford to put food on the table or the prescription drugs? And now you're seeing a lot of more people start to voice a, uh, a discontent with the governor. And that's risky because we need people to buy into uh, the lockdown as a whole if it's going to work. Hmm. Uh, Jesse, I just wanted to, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by bed count. What, what is, what exactly? Sure. So. Uh, right now, I think the latest that the governor had uh, reported was that uh, 
uh, our ICU uh, beds, uh, the beds that we have to respond to people that are suffering, that get COVID, that have to go to the hospital, need to get on a ventilator per se, uh, need more intensive care, is at about 80%. Well, that percentage is high. We'd like to have more of a buffer. So effectively what he's telling us is that we have about 20% capacity across the state with regard to open beds so that if someone gets sick tomorrow and they need to go to the hospital, they can actually land in a bed uh, and, 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 and be cared for with the, the facilities that are available to them. And that's what is generally referred to as bed count. And so if the current bed count means that with the spike in cases, we're getting closer and closer to having all the beds filled, well, then that creates a problem and a risk for us because as soon as all the beds are filled, the next person that gets sick is now waiting for care and that's a problem that could potentially cost them their lives. So when I say that we wanted to address bed count earlier, we should have addressed that back in the summer, released some of our rainy day funds to help accommodate that so that we had more healthcare beds available so that we never got close to that dangerous or risk area in terms of available open beds. Thanks. Martha, just an FYI, Tara needed to reboot. So she signed off and she'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. And I asked her if she wanted to comment on this topic and she said that was that it was fine not to. So Okay. Yep. Well, I I don't know. Christine, did you want to say something? Um, I I do. Um I don't know how much how much more we want to get into this. I guess I just see the issue of bed count. Increasing the bed count just means that we're willing to have more people almost die so they have to go to the hospital. So the bed count, I don't know that the governor was um, necessarily saying, we don't have enough capacity, we need more money so we have more capacity. I think he was trying to actually save lives and have less people need um, the bed. So it's, there, I think there's two different approaches to it. One is let's set up field hospitals and um, everybody just take the risk you're willing to take and we have enough beds to take care of you. And the governor chose a more conservative risk approach, which was we I'm going to not have as many people need hospital beds. So you can argue that, but I, I guess in that case, I would side with the governor's approach because I don't want to need one of those hospital beds. And I don't think anybody else does. The um, thing I did want to say, though, was um, I have expressed disagreement with the governor on this last closure. And part of that is because I feel like his approach wasn't nuanced enough. And we have businesses and we certainly have a lot of them in Kitsap County that invested a ton of money and spent a lot of time complying with the public health rules that Kitsap County Health put in place with small crowds, you know, related, only related people sitting together, um, six feet social distancing, everybody wearing masks. The, um, I know one of the fitness centers made the biggest investment they'd ever made in a high quality hospital grade air filter and they were taking reservations. So they're, um, they were maintaining their membership, they expanded their hours and people were getting exercise, which is also good. And they got shut down just like the fitness center that's protesting in Yakima did that didn't pay attention to any of those rules. And my concern leading up to this moratorium was that nobody was enforcing the rules anywhere in the state. And as a result, the whole state, he shut down the sectors equally across the whole state. And I'm not, I don't completely agree with that approach. Having said that, it's easy to second guess and everybody has different risk tolerances. And um, I would like to have, I would like to have seen a different approach, but um, it is what it is. And I will support him and what we need to do to get those businesses open again as quickly as possible. And if we could get rates down, um, I don't think he'd hesitate to reopen, um, to let businesses reopen. And then people would feel safe too. And let's be reasonable, let's be realistic customers were slowing down anyway because people didn't want to eat outside and they were and we were scared to eat inside so um i just wanted to get that on the table that there is disagreement even among democrats um and there's many 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 ways to have handled this i think i agree with what you're saying i'm i'm certainly 
is my daughter's will test. I've never, I'm not a very, um, I comply because this is what the governor has asked us to do. And that's why we have him there. Um, it's, but it's not something I really enjoy doing. So as I'm sure a lot of people don't. So anyway, the next question, Colette. Yeah, this is a follow on question to COVID-19, which is, um, I think I heard on the radio today that Washington State's getting its first, it's getting an allocation of about 200,000 um, doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, any feeling for when those might start being distributed or um, when they'll, they'll come back with more so that they can go beyond, let's say, first and second tier priority recipients. Is that something that you guys would be able to answer? I don't, is that something you would know? It's still too soon, huh? Senator Randall, would, is that something you would know, be able to answer? No, I will say that um, until recently, we thought our first tranche of vaccine would be closer to 50,000. Um, and so the increase to 200,000 is a welcome um, you know, increase, particularly for the frontline healthcare workers who are going to be in that tier one field. I've had so many calls lately with um, you know, providers who are multitasking in our Zoom meeting because they're working on their distribution plans. So um, I don't have any insider knowledge about when we'll get a second wave, but I know that um, you know, our, our health systems are working overtime to be ready to distribute. Okay. Um, I think there, there was a, there had been a question a little bit earlier about uh, whether or not making broadband more broad, more broadly, pun intended, uh, making broadband more widely available within the state, um, especially to support students who are working remotely as well as businesses, obviously. Is, is on the docket for um, the budget. Yes, it is. I, Jesse may want to talk more about that because yeah, he's a technology or, person, yeah. but that's definitely on the priority list for our Senate Democratic Caucus. Okay. I wish Dan had uh, been able to make it because I know he represents the 35th and uh, I have a feeling that they were very interested in enhancing broadband. But Jesse, do you have anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I think um, with the way that we've addressed this in the past, as long as we continue down that path, and, and again, I think uh, Representative Hansen uh, gave a good bill that was uh, bipartisanly supported that, that kind of addressed this. And what you see, and, and what I'm in favor of supporting is a continued approach that allows more players to enter the market. And one of the key things that I liked about Representative Hansen's bill was that he allowed the PUDs to jump into the market to fill a gap. Um, what I don't wanna see is uh, potential bigger carve outs to the, the bigger uh, providers as it is. I don't wanna see uh, tax uh, incentives or any type of a bigger incentive that, that, cave, that uh, caters to uh, Comcast or CenturyLink because they've already shown that they don't care about some of these rural areas because they, they don't consider it profitable. And so to the degree that we expand upon the model that Representative Hansen started and allowed other providers in those spaces to get into those rural communities and provide that bandwidth. I mean, so when you have uh, other, uh, PUDs are another or example that was used that Representative Hansen started because in his district, he had a PUD that was prepared to, to target that. In the 26th district, we have uh, Penn Light. That's a, a co-op that provides energy. But what they have is they have, they have, uh, uh, access in the ground as they're laying their their uh, technology for uh, energy and um, uh, they have access to expand broadband through that uh, the infrastructure they've already built and to the degree we allow these players to enter the market we're increasing competition which will number one provide uh, for these rural areas but number two increase competition which will drive costs down and we don't have to give uh, you know I don't want to entertain a, another uh, corporate lobbyist for these guys coming through and asking me to give them uh, some additional uh, state dollars that we could otherwise spend towards healthcare um, or, or student uh, uh, education or um, low income health. I'd, I'd rather increase the model. So I think that's where you'll see some uh, bipartisan support. Thank you. 
Um, okay. Are there are there other questions that there, there, Colette? I mean, I got some questions um, from people ahead of time, and I was just looking to see. But uh, do you have others that you want to that have come up? Just another tax revenue related question, which is as hybrids, more hybrids and electric cars come on the road, gas taxes appear to be decreasing. Um, what, al what alternatives would you consider to bring more funding for road maintenance and construction? Yeah, that's a good one. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to start if you, if you like. Okay, go ahead. Well, so I, I, you know, I, I believe that we are seeing an, an increasing desire to consider a new taxing uh, paradigm, and that's really the road user charge, because if, you, if you're taxing on road usage, uh, then, then you capture those uh, tax revenues from electric vehicles or alternative uh, fueled vehicles. And um, I'm amicable to that, and what I've propo uh, proposed uh, uh, in the last uh, session that we just had was that we we start with a default point, and that would be that if we're going to transition from a gas tax to a, a road user charge, that we don't allow double taxation of anybody, because I don't want to affect uh, commuters that are, uh, you know, um, uh, paying a lot in taxes now just to get to work. We don't want to hurt people as we transition over, and there will be a transition period because of uh, debt obligations that we have to pay that, that are tied to certain gas tax revenue. So it will take a while to pay those revenues or those obligations off while we transition over. So that would be the first starting point. And I've uh, uh, drafted a constitutional amendment to say, as we transition over, if we're gonna do that, let's take the potential for double taxation off the table, pass that amendment so we don't have to worry about it. Then we can uh, have more confidence across the board and not run into a, a problem, a, bi a partisan problem there. The second thing that I would say that I, I'm very concerned with as a technology professional is that I don't want to invade anybody's privacy as we ro as we rotate over, or if we do move over to an alternative taxing solution like a road user charge. And so the second constitutional amendment that I proposed would be, if we're gonna go down that route, let's implement it with technology that doesn't track where people drive. We don't, we don't want any, I don't want personally any taxation formula, whether it's through a contracted uh, paradigm or through a state regulated paradigm, that enforces a road user charge through GPS tracking, for example. We have other, and the pilot programs we've done through transportation have already proven out we don't need to use that type of technology. So let's, if we implement a road user charge, let's take the privacy concerns off the table as well. And I think if we get there, I think you'll see a lot more bipartisan support that will probably get us there quicker ultimately. And then we, then we don't have to have those uh, concerns about some vehicles are taxed, some aren't, mm -hmm. and uh, we can get on. And it'll also be a more, uh, what, we, what we've seen in studies thus far is it'll be a much, much more stable and consistent form of taxation. And I think we can get there if we address those two issues up front. Um, thank you. Um, so are there other, any other big questions that, because we're getting closer to the end, I, and I did want to ask something um, before we close up. So Colette, any others? Why don't you go ahead? Well, okay, so my question is more about how this is going to work, um, because, you know, we're going to have a, a, a virtual, essentially a virtual uh, legislature. And I wonder if one of you could talk about sort of how are you going to conduct uh, committee meetings? How are people going to be able to testify? How are you going to make sure that this is a, um, that we're having an open, uh, transparent, legislature and and yet and do it all on zoom so uh whoever wants to talk about that any of you um senator randall oh. okay oh i was gonna say something just because i haven't talked much and because okay. i'm an expert on the in the weeds tax um issues and and you know healthcare issues yet but um from what i from my perspective you know this really does give access to some of the more marginalized communities that have not been able to show up because they can't afford to take a day off of work and find childcare to get down to Olympia to testify on a bill that impacts their lives. And so I'm really actually hopeful um, that because it's on Zoom, because everything is, you know, as always gonna be on TVW, but we're gonna allow people to testify uh, remotely that it will actually make our government a little more transparent and more accessible to the people who really need to be there 
um, sharing their stories. And so I'm really excited. It's going to be on Zoom. Uh, and um, I know we're working through technology challenges, how to have side conversations and how you can be pulled out of a committee meeting to meet with a constituent and then go back to the committee meeting virtually. I will say I also recognize the inequities around technology and not everybody has access to technology. And so that is something I'm also worried about. Um, but you know, people can still call and there's still a phone number on our website where you can reach our office. You can still email to set up an appointment. Um, and we're doing all we can to do this in a safe way during a global pandemic. And I'm really impressed with the people um, you know, that work at the state legislature who have um, you know, been able to navigate all of the technology challenges to make it happen. So there's trade-offs. You know, I am a hugger and I'm gonna miss my first session, all those side conversations and hugging my colleagues when we win things and being there with them. I'm gonna miss that. Um, and I'm also glad I get to stay in my district and be here for my own family and educating my own children <laughs> while we're going through this too. So hmm. pros and cons. <laughs> Martha, I wanted to, can I see if I can um, share a screen? I think that I can show you what our voting is going to look like from the inside perspective. I love it. And, yeah, so be, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Um, but when, when, for those of you who have been engaged in us while we've been in committees, we can get all of our stuff, um, all of our committee documents and stuff online. And so we always have our laptops pulled up and we can follow along with whatever PowerPoint or what, what, whatever presentation is being made. We usually can watch it on our screen and we can multitask and look at our email. And so I get live email from people like Catherine All saying, wait a second, why did you say that? Right in the middle of things. Um, we're probably going to be able to multitask less because we're going to be doing the whole committee meeting online. And so that's going to be different for members too. There's going to be a work slowdown, I think. But let me see if I can share this. Can you see anything? Not yet. Collect. Is there anything you can do? Oh, wait, it's happening. That? Yep, I got something. Good. Yeah, so if you can see any of this um, behind, when I'm looking at this, can you see the yay and the nay, the cancel my vote? Yes. You have not voted yet. So we're going to be, we will have um, electronic voting on our laptops and then we'll click yay or nay. And then on my screen, um, our gallery is covering up the names of senators. Can you see names of senators or yes. is that covered? Yes, I can. Um, so you can see, so as we vote, the absent will turn into a yay or a nay. And so we can track who's voting um, in live time. Mm. So I just thought that's neither here nor there. I just wanted you to get a sense of the technology that we're, um, that we're working with, like the legislative technology people are trying to figure out how to make this work for us. So I was wondering how you're gonna deal with lobbyists we're not. <laughs> I'll just share. Um, so I chair co-chair the um, uh, Joint Legislative Executive Committee for Planning for Aging and Disability Issues. And we had um, a meeting over the summer that Senate Committee Services staff was circulating sort of as an example for what remote testimony can look like. And we were hearing feedback on the proposed um, developmental disabilities administration budget cuts that the agency had released when we thought the budget was going to be much more dire. And what uh, co-chair Theringer and I chose to do was to sort the folks who had signed up to testify and put the lobbyists at the bottom so that um, individual members of the public who weren't representing organizations could be invited to speak first to tell their stories. And I think that might be something that I carry with me to our higher education committee as well. You know, we, there are certainly experts that we need to hear from on issues and we'll, you know, probably have a pro panel and a con panel, but then when it comes to public comment, um, we really want to center public voices. Well, thank you, good, That's, that would be good. Um, we're getting to the end of, of six, well, I said this would be about an hour and a half and it's getting towards 6.30. 
So uh, are there any other last uh, questions or burning comments that uh, somebody wants to make either um, through the chat or wave your hand, I guess, if you, so, okay. Um, this is Diana, can you unmute? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yes, I, I did put a question to Colette. Um, there were a couple of us who were um, given the recent attacks at the Spokane Democratic headquarters. I wanted to know what kind of acknowledgement um, can be made by our senators about that. And uh, how do we keep these events in mind going forward because things might still arise as we, we see they are happening around the nation. Now it's in our backyard. So I was hoping that somebody could acknowledge that and um, speak their uh, minds about that. I, I, I will say that um, because it, it, locally, I, maybe some people saw that uh, uh, someone from Kitsap was arrested because of uh, attack he made down in Olympia against a, in a protest. Um, so it is an issue. And I think we all want to make sure that we're not that that there is no support for any kind of um, violent action. But I, I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to say about that. But I think we're all in agreement that that is inappropriate and, and should be followed up on. This guy has been arrested. This is one person. Uh, and the, the, the one from Spokane has been arrested. Of course, we don't have a name, but uh, I, I was hoping that some of the uh, representatives or senators could speak to their base to show that they are not in agreement with that kind of activity and to appeal to them to um, not be doing such things and and you know i think that they need to come out and uh, voice from their leadership the abhorrence of such acts i'd like to know i'd like to hear that um well Di you know, Diana, I think that, that, that's probably something you want me to address and um i would say that i, I don't know i haven't read, seen any of the news on the spokane but uh the one with the local person that was uh, that has been arrested for uh, discharging his firearm. Um, I have spoken to that and you, you'll notice that I haven't come out in support of that person. I think a lot of people would say, well, isn't that kind of the group that uh, <laughs> Representative Young supports? That's certainly what my opponent in the last election said. Uh, but one of the reasons I don't support that person and have stayed quiet on is because I think he was a fool for brandishing his firearm in the, in the first place. You know, when if I'm going to stand up and support Second Amendment rights as strongly as I do as a conservative Republican, then you also have to you also have to admit when people don't follow uh, common safety practices that a lot of us that do support Second Amendments adhere to. And that kid, there's clear video of showing that kid, but I didn't see when he actually discharged it and, and when it happened, but someone did show me some videos. I made some calls to find out what actually happened. And there are there is video of that kid pulling his gun out and brandishing it. That's a, that's a violation of law right there. And I'm glad he's arrested uh, because specifically you don't do that. If you're gonna go down and you're gonna go get involved in stuff like that. And I think everybody needs to chill out and try to work together. I mean, th there, is, there is not a, a session that goes by where uh, we as legislators are gonna go down there where I'm not gonna uh, get on uh, Senator Randall or Senator Rolfus's nerves or vice versa because of policy differences. But at the end of the day, we try to work together and we don't support violence. And I think all of us agree, uh, agree to that. And that's the example we should be setting. That's the example these both sides of the uh, aisle uh, should be setting uh, even for unelected officials. We have to be very judicious. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I am referring to the Spokane Democratic headquarters being threatened and damaged. Uh, but that was my basic uh, concern there. Um, that that was going a little too far more than brandishing a gun. So thank you for your answer though. So thank you. Um, and I think um, we're about to, 
to end. So I want to thank our uh, representatives for uh, and senators for appearing today and for all your all your very good answers and um, thank you. We're we're lucky to have you. So we appreciate you representing us and uh, thank you for coming this evening. So with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna close. So thank you everybody for coming. Nice. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care.